You should be live as usual. Wait for a few moments. Okay, and everyone is, should be pulled into this session now. So welcome everyone to the last, uh, last two talk block of the, uh, of the meeting. Uh, or not of the meeting, of the day, sorry. Uh, the day is, it, it's only day three. Um, I'm very, very excited to, uh, to, to present our next speaker. So, so one thing that I think is, is important, I was hoping in this meeting to take seriously, uh, the interaction between digital studies of science and studies of digital science. And digital studies of science doesn't have to mean uh, uh, just things that have been done since you know 1995 or something. So I'm very excited to have some 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 proper some proper history of science on the program. Uh, so it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Stefan Hesperik and Walter with uh, co-author work with with Jörg Walter who can't who can't be here uh, on digital interdisciplinarity in uh, dissertations in the Holy Roman Empire. So please, without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Charles. Um, it seems to be a truism that there is no interdisciplinarity without disciplines. And the rece received wisdom in the literature on the history of interdisciplinarity contends that disciplines were established only in the course of the 18th century. So if we are interested in how interdisciplinarity evolved, we must investigate the history of knowledge starting from that point. This assumption is problematic. I acknowledge that the term discipline comprises more than a rubric and a classification of knowledge as we find it, for example, in the Polygomena of late ancient commentaries on the Aristotelian corpus, or Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, or later in the encyclopedic projects of thinkers like Alsted, Comenius, or Leibniz. But disciplines like history, philology, logic, or natural philosophy did have effects on the organization of institutions of higher learning in the period I'm interested in, the 17th century. They served as denominations for professorships, they shaped the organization of books and libraries, and, and this is the topic of today's talk, they were used as rubrics for the classification of early modern dissertations. Whether or not this suffices to talk about the existence of scientific disciplines in the 17th century in the full sense, is maybe an open question. If you feel uncomfortable, uh, you can also substitute my talk of disciplines with talk of subdisciplines or proto disciplines. I won't go into that discussion at large. In this non budget project I present here today, we look at various ways to process metadata for early modern dissertations published between 1601 and 1700 as they are recorded in Germany's national bibliography for this period, VD17, VD17. Today, I want to present work on a subset of these metadata comprising more than 900 interdisciplinary dissertations, dissertations that contain more than one term for a discipline or subdiscipline or protodiscipline in their title. They make up roughly 4% of the total corpus. Such an inqui inquiry is itself interdisciplinary. We operate based on the premise that, at least for the 17th century, history of science and history of the humanities should cooperate in the investigation of what one could call history of scholarship. And for this, we use the work products of professionals in information science, namely libra librarians specialized in cataloging old prints. And the methods we use to trace the evolution of interdisciplinarity in our data set and to identify interesting patterns are themselves interdisciplinary, namely those of the digital humanities. Interdisciplinary dissertations first came to our attention during our attempts to classify the dissertations in question according to the subdiscipline they belong to. For this, and this was the work done by Jörg Walter, we used machine learning algorithms for which the correct classification of interdisciplinary dissertations was a significant challenge. 
So we decided to investigate these titles separately. A second factor to be mentioned is the regrettable lack of uniformity in the capture of titles in the original data set. We can't discuss details here, but originally only 14,650 titles were amenable to machine learning based disciplinary classification, while the remaining 5,800 contained additional title elements that created too much noise for machine learning algorithms to succeed. Our interdisciplinary data set contains 629 interdisciplinary titles in the classifiable data and 330 in, non, in the non-classifiable data set, um, taking into account stop words like toponyms and so on, uh, we end up with 920 dissertations. And that's a preliminary number, please don't quote it. Um, this is still work in progress. If we now look at how the labels for such dissertations are distributed, um, the largest number are dissertations um, in the intersection of history and politics marked as historic politic. Uh, I've simply taken the stemmed forms we have used to search to label um, the graph. Uh, the second position, um, historical philological dissertations, but uh, historical or philological expertise can also be uh, coupled with other philosophical disciplines, for example, physics. So we also find 32 historical physical dissertations. And another uh, coupling that is worth mentioning, 22 logical metaphysical titles. And um, I confess I'm a bit envious listening to all these talks with uh, thousands of papers in the corpus. Um, we are talking here about dissertations published over the course of a century, and then uh, 22 is not that much. So um, don't put too much trust in absolute numbers or even percentages. The conclusions we can draw here are largely qualitative. Um, the preponderance of historical and philological disciplines is, of course, also mirrored when we look at disciplinary labels um, across interdisciplinary titles and count them separately. History is leading with 500 mentions. The next disciplines are politics or political philosophy, philology, and physics, by and large, in agreement with the um, uh, image we got from the counting of mere uh, of the interdisciplinary labels as such. This bar plot also shows the relative proportions of labels in the first position, for example, historico in historico politica, that is blue, and the second position of these compounds, politica in historico politica, orange. <coughs> um, this finding suggested that there might be some difference between both positions so that we could identify one position in these compounds as superordinate and the other as subordinate. But uh, analysis just of the interdisciplinary titles as such showed that between the two spheres within each disciplinary label, there's almost no overlap. So we had within the titles as such, no real indication for how the two halves of these interdisciplinary uh, compound, adjective compounds relate to each other. Um, but uh, I return to that problem later on. We also looked at the temporal evolution of the subgenre. Um, there you can see that uh, the, pro the proportion of interdisciplinary dissertations in relation to our data set of philosophical dissertations in total increases throughout the 17th century. Um, again, don't put too much trust in the linear regression, but I think even if you just look at the scatter plot as such, uh, the increase is more or less obvious. So this shows, just to clarify, 
how many percent of philosophical dissertations in a given year were dissertations with an interdisciplinary label. And you see some uh, high points around 10%. In other years, it was around 1%. So there is a certain variability. Um, but again, um, these numbers can be interpreted qualitatively, but the record we have has uh, serious holes. So um, uh, this should be taken uh, with a certain amount of caution. If you then look uh, whether we can identify authors which put, who put a special emphasis on interdisciplinary dissertations, um, uh, what we find is that the absolute count of interdisciplinary dissertations as such um, is not a sufficient indicator for relevance. Um, the example for that is the last person in this list, uh, Jakob Tomasius, at least colleagues who have a some acquaintance with the history of early modern philosophy may have heard the name uh, as a teacher and correspondent of Leibniz. And uh, we have in German libraries eight interdisciplinary dissertations, which is not uh, yeah, uh, which is a quite considerable number, also if you compare it to the other authors in this uh, table. But we must put this in relation to the overall output from Tomasius that we can find, and those are 152 dissertations. So only 5.3% of his overall output were interdisciplinary, uh, while for the other four authors, um, the percentage is much higher. So if you want to uh, know more about the background of these interdisciplinary dissertations, you should look at those authors for which they formed a considerable part of their output, not just at the absolute numbers. Um, and those are names that even most specialists on the history of German philosophy in the 17th century um, may not have heard. Maybe Egidius Strauch, who was a student and professor in Wittenberg and later rector in Danzig. He published mainly dissertations on um, historical subdisciplines like geography, for example, a dissertation on Iceland with a respondent coming from Iceland, a co-author. Matthias Berneger was a correspondent of Galilei and Kepler, a professor in Strasbourg. And he's present in our corpus mainly with historico-political dissertations, for example, on the migration of students or the kingdom of Hungary. Roth was a teacher in Ulm, um, wrote historico-political and historico-philological dissertations on the history of torture, but also maybe uh, to compound for his sins, a historico-ethical dissertation. And Hopfer was a professor in Tübingen uh, who wrote historico-physical dissertations for example, on the spontaneous generation of animals living in fire, the salamander and the purausta, or purausta, I think. Um, yeah, this is just to give you um, some cursory impressions what kind of material uh, I'm talking here about. Um, what we have looked at in some depth are what you could call topics of dissertations. And uh, that's more easily explained using um, a typical dissertation title. This is one I've made up, so you don't find that in the corpus. Let's assume someone published a dissertatio historico physica di natura aquae, a historico physical dissertation on the nature of water. The biogram we are interested in uh, that signifies what we call the topic would be de natura, the essence or the being or the nature of water. And what we wanted to know is, does natura appear in historical dissertations, in physical dissertations, in both disciplines making up the compound historico physica, or in none? And these are the results. 
72% of our corpus um, have no biogram that uh, is used in either historical or physical dissertation. 21.9% um, of our corpus um, use a topic that is mentioned in a dissertation in one of the constituent disciplines, so either historical or physical, logical or metaphysical. And um, 72 dissertations um, have a topic that appears in both of their constituent disciplines. We now take a closer look at the distribution among uh, disciplines of these one topic dissertation titles. So uh, in 36.09% uh, of historico-political dissertations, the biogram starting with D occurs in either historical or political dissertation. Um, I won't read out the whole table. You see that the numbers variate, um, especially low in logical metaphysical dissertations, uh, high in historical political. Um, this is just to show that uh, averages across the whole corpus may obliterate uh, differences between disciplines. And now we come back to the question, to which extent may the position of a discipline label in this interdisciplinary compound help us to determine whether uh, one discipline is regarded as primary in contrast to the other. And uh, for this, we looked at these topical biograms. Um, those biograms appearing only in one discipline, those biograms appearing in two disciplines don't help us to decide which discipline is more important, and those that don't appear in a discipline at all don't help either. And there we found a certain uniformity in that um, disciplines appearing in the first position, historico, etico, philologico, share less topics with dissertations in uh, this, you could say, unified, uh, unitary discipline. So only 20% of um, topics uh, of dissertations with philologico also appear in purely philological dissertations. 80% of topics um, where historica is in the second position of the interdisciplinary compound, have a topic that also appears in historical dissertations. And to cut a long story short, it seems that uh, those um, dissertations or that dissertations that um, obey our criterion, uh, a topic only in one uh, disciplinary class, um, are largely subsumed under the adjective in the second position. So historical political dissertations are primarily political. Historical philologic, philological dissertations are primarily philological. Um, historical physical dissertations are primarily physical. So what we could not solve through an internal analysis of the titles could be solved when looking at the um, presence of what we call topics in purely disciplinary dissertations. Um, this already leads me uh, to my discussion and conclusions. Um, our data show that most interdisciplinary dissertations were produced in the overlapping area between the nascent disciplines of history and philology on the one hand, and disciplines of practical philosophy, most prominently politics on the other hand. The largest interdisciplinary group of titles with at least one theoretical subdiscipline of philosophy 
are historical physical dissertations who came in at rank four with 32 titles. We also saw an upward trend regarding the overall number of interdisciplinary dissertations in the second half of the 17th century. And I have the hunch um, that these two developments, on the other hand, the, the uh, prominence of history and philology, and on the other hand, the increase over the 17th century, link these interdisciplinary dissertations to a phenomenon that uh, historians of knowledge in Germany in this period call polyhistoricism or polyhistoria, um, the appropriation of knowledge from many different domains, not uh, because people were looking for generalized insights into the essence of the world, like in evolving natural science, or in metaphysics, or in Aristotelian natural philosophy, but with an interest in individual phenomena as such, the original meaning of history, historia, so polyhistoria, knowledge of many different phenomena, um, our finding that for 70%, we either don't have a topic, or sorry, the number was 40%, um, have a topic that does not appear in disciplinary dissertations uh, may further bolster this thesis. Um, we would now have to look how the supervisors, the presides of these dissertations uh, figure in this broader um, um, development in yeah, what I call the history of scholarship precisely because this is not purely um, history of science, this is not purely history of the humanities. Um, our analysis of titles has also shown that it might make sense to distinguish two senses or modes of interdisciplinarity in this text, what one could call object-bound interdisciplinarity, which is based on a topic that is relevant for both disciplines and appears in single discipline dissertations in both disciplines. Um, for those who have background in the history of philosophy in this period, paradigmatic cases for these are dissertations on the soul, disputed area between natural philosophy and metaphysics, um, and logical metaphysical dissertations, for example, on the categories, again, a topic that is discussed both in logic and metaphysics. Um, and from this, we may distinguish method-bound interdisciplinarity, and that might be connected uh, with those dissertations where the topic is present only in one discipline. So if you write a historical physical dissertation on natura, and natura is a term that appears predominantly in physical dissertations and is absent in historical, what does history add? history may add an additional methodological perspective. Um, finally, um, we have also seen that if there's only one topic, in the, uh, a topic for one discipline in the dissertation title, in the majority of cases across various interdisciplines, um, this topic is mostly found in disciplinary dissertations for the discipline in the second position. So this means that in the majority of cases, though not exclusively, we can surmise that these compounds like historical, physical, historical, political are, as you would say in linguistics, hypotactic, subordinating the first to the second discipline. And that's it already. What we can learn from metadata may be to a certain extent uh, limited, but with a certain amount of creativity and ingenuity, um, you can force the water to come out of the stone.
Thanks so much. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's impressive how how far you can go on on the metadata. This is really this is really interesting. Um, while I wait on uh, on the on the chat to catch up, let me. Uh, uh, I, I have a I have a bunch of questions of my own, but let me start with uh, uh, let me start with perhaps this one, uh, which is more clarificatory. So what? In this period, what is the role of a dissertation in the career of the person who writes it? So I, I'm thinking the some of the touchstones that I have for this are are, are, are radically different. That is to say, you know, the uh, supervisor would sometimes write the majority of the dissertation or something like this, right? So I'm wondering for this for this for this period in Germany, what what uh, what's the what's the life of this this object? For these people yeah um uh, that would be a separate presentation because uh, i've also engaged in a prosopographical comparative um, analysis of presides and respondents and the for example if you look at the age curve uh, the age of presides what we call today supervisors sinks rapidly after 30. So for a lot of authors of these dissertations, they presided, but presided as a qualification, namely as a qualification to be allowed to teach philosophy. But as it is today, um, a lot of people after that left the profession uh, in the early modern university, um, not necessarily academia, but they tried to advance to theology and law and medicine not least because those were better paid positions. Um, so after 30, you only find dissertations where professors really supervise. Um, the question of authorship uh, is something I studiously avoid because um, reams of pages have filled with this without any ultimate conclusion. Um, in some cases, um, people indicate that um, even though they appear as respondent, it is them who have written the text. But this goes back to these problems about the capture of titles I mentioned in the beginning. The bibliography we are using does not always record everything that is on the title page because they also have reproductions of the title page. But the way the material on the title page is reproduced is not uniform either. So different schools of librarians over the 20 years of this project chose different things to include into what we can get as machine readable data. And that's a huge deficiency, um, but I don't want to complain too much um, because people planning this project in the 1990s could not anticipate the rapid evolution of um, various methods we could use to, use to uh, process these data. Sure. Yeah. No, that 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 makes very good sense. Um, uh, Nicola Bertoli in the chat asks or says interest. First of all, starts by saying interesting talk uh, and asks. So I was I was wondering whether uh, your corpus reflects. Uh, the evolution of the meaning of the term natural history, like Historia Naturalis in the early modern period, or if there's other ways that you've caught, um, now, I'm, now I'm expanding on this question, changes in this terminology over, over the period of the, the century of, 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 uh, of metadata. Um, yeah, the diachronic analysis, especially of these interdisciplinary titles, is something still on the agenda. Um, what I can say is that if I have messed up the regular expression in searching for these interdisciplinary terms, um, there are no dissertations in natural history. And this strengthens my claim because they belong to historico physica. And this strengthens my claim that these are disciplinary or proto terms for disciplines or proto disciplines because um, you had to pick an area which was in some way socially effective within the university, for example, as the denomination of a professorship. And there are no professorships for natural history. So there cannot be dissertations that have the 
interdisciplinary label um, historio naturalis, uh, historico naturalis or natural historico or whatever you may um, make up there. Um, and since the number of titles is so, so I will look at the diachronic distribution, but I have not much hope because 900 sounds okay, but 900 over a hundred years, it's just 10 per year. And I anticipate that the data will be so noisy that you cannot make really um, well-founded assumptions. And an additional problem, um, dissertation prints were an extremely ephemeral, ephemeral genre. So um, we can estimate that we have lost more than we have preserved. And maybe it's only a quarter or 20% or even less um, that we find today in libraries. Um, and there are also certain geographical biases in the bibliography because certain areas in Germany did not participate in this, like the West and the South. Um, so I'm a bit careful, uh, I have not that high expectations um, that we can really uh, get to a fine-grained historical analysis how certain disciplines um, evolved over the whole century. Sure. No, that makes that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, uh, Modi Misrahi has a, a, a pair of questions. So, so first, uh, similar to the previous about about natural philosophy, about about, about that other way of, of picking up the same the same kind of kind of point. Actually, let me because we we we're, we're not uh, we we have plenty of time. Let me go ahead and let you answer respond to that really quickly. If it may be it may be a similar answer. So. Yeah, that would be Physica. And um, as I said, we started, this is maybe something I should explain. Um, we started to look at the interdisciplinary dissertations for two reasons. For one, Charles, you and I had a conversation on Twitter where you complained that there is not much work on the history of interdisciplinarity. And at the same time, uh, I looked at our results and found out that it's especially these interdisciplinary dissertations which create additional noise that ruins our precision and recall. So I thought we could put them apart and look at them separately. But what is still missing um, is now to rerun the classification of the original dissertations without the noisy interdisciplinary data. And after that, uh, I will be in a better position to answer questions regarding yeah, what are they called? Unitary disciplines? Well, if you want to contrast a discipline and an interdiscipline, what's then the discipline? Yeah, I don't know, but fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and let me pick up with the second half of this question. So, so also, could you give uh, could you give it a, a, an example of of this method bound interdisciplinarity? So, for example, like. Um, he says, you know, for instance, when like Hume is trying to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects, is that the kind of thing that we that we have in mind here? Uh, no, it's it's rather. Um, I mean, I have looked only at the titles, and the titles themselves tell you what the dissertation is about, but they don't tell you the content as such. Um, and I believe in the context I'm working in, what the age can achieve is to structure a field in ways um, that are less prejudiced than our traditional scholarship in this area. For example, um, a lot of work is done on school metaphysics and school logic because this has effects on the history of philosophy as we perceive it in the 18th century. So prehistory, pre-prehistory of Kant, for example. And the history of natural philosophy in Germany in this period is comparatively under-researched, although it is a more prominent discipline, presumably, than metaphysics and logic. Um, but um, as long as we have no reliable way to OCR this stuff, 
in a way that makes the full text available, um, there is a wall which digital methods cannot get over. Um, so as for now, this would indicate um, which of these dissertations carry a special interest for a researcher interested in this period as a whole. And the argument for this is not just the reading experience and the intuition of the scholar, but um, objective facts of how this or that author or group of dissertation fits into the overall landscape. So it's distant work without the reading. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's a great way to put it. Um, question from from uh, Rose Trappis who asks, uh, says, maybe I missed this in the talk. It's, it's been a long day, but I'd be interested to hear if you could speculate for the reasons for the dominance of those disciplines uh, in the interdisciplinary dissertations that were so that were so predominant. Or is it is it too hard to say without being able to have access to the to the content? Yeah, if my assumption that this is linked to the development of polyhistoricism is correct. Then it was historical and philological disciplines with their, you could say, ideographical approach. So not interested in laws, but in the individual phenomenon um, that were the drivers of this broader polyhistoric movement you could say. And then if the dissertations are in fact connected to this movement, then historians of this part of the history of knowledge will readily agree that it's then no surprise that the majority of dissertations are in some way linked to history and philology. And the increase over the 17th century may then be due to the increased establishment of these disciplines within the philosophical faculty. So in the beginning of the 17th century, you may have people doing work in philology, but maybe not that many in Germany and certainly not as professors for their discipline. But the institutionalization of philology and history uh, as university disciplines within the context of philosophy took place in the second half of the 17th century. Very interesting. Okay, that's so that's helpful for a question, a clarification, well, a sort of clarification and expansion question that I wanted to ask. I'll pose it anyway to see if you if, if there's anything you want to you want to add about it. But that was something that that struck me was this uh, this upward this upward pointing trend, this pretty mar remarkable upward pointing trend over the course of of the century. And I guess I don't know, there's just a strange way to phrase this, but just like, is this, does that make sense with our understanding of where this trend would go in the 18th? Just to the extent that, to the extent that we have an understanding of where that trend would go? I mean, were you expecting that? How to, cause that's, that's a pretty, I mean, that's an, that, that, that graph is, is pretty striking. Um, again, under the assumption that my hypothesis about polyhistory is not completely misguided, um, we must know two things. Um, first, at the beginning of the 17th century, 18th century, in the early Enlightenment, it was exactly this kind of, um, do people know the German word Wunderkammer? Like these rooms full of strange, miraculous objects and uh, I, I learned about it in around. my I learned about it in my HPS graduate training, but I'm not sure how many people in the, in, yeah. in the audience so, have so HPS these were, these were basically Proto museums um, uh, at an aristocratic court where people uh, collected uh, lots of many different strange things from all over the world and from all ages. When I think about polyhistory, I think about this kind of arrangement of objects and knowledge about objects. And this came under heavy scrutiny in the early Enlightenment. So, being a polyhistor in the 18th century. Um, was not something you could be proud of because um, the early German Enlightenment emphasized exactly the opposite, the importance of thinking for yourself, selbstdenken, autonomy, and polyhistory is the exact opposite. This is also, of course, an explanation of why this phenomenon um, 
is not widely known because people have bought this bad press. Uh, Enlightenment authors uh, communicate uh, the, the bad image uh, Enlightenment authors created. Um, besides that, more concrete trends will have to wait until um, the project for the Achtzen, the subsequent bibliography for the 18th century is finished. It's underway and you probably can get data, but they are not as complete as I would like them to be. So uh, this is what I'm waiting for. I see. So, okay. So I was I, I actually, that's a, that, that, that's a question that had occurred to me. So the, the current status of the project is they have, they've, the 17th that you've done is completely finished, but the 18th isn't yet. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. With that, we're, we're very close to time. So I think what I'll go ahead and do is wrap it there. Thank you one more time. Thanks so much. This was a really, really neat talk. I really enjoyed getting to, uh, getting to see this. And uh, with that, yes, the last talk of the day will be back in just a few minutes. So thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you all. Bye.